commercial real estate is kind of the trifecta. It is, it is the way that the wealthy are able to continue building their wealth while offsetting their tax bills to almost zero dollars. They invest in commercial real estate and they're boosting their net worth by forcing appreciation, getting additional cash flow, and offsetting their taxes. It's cheat code status. Welcome back to the channel. So we're gonna be getting into why real estate is the cornerstone of wealth creation. So a lot of people, when they're uh, thinking about real estate, they only consider the cash flow side but there's more than one way that real estate can make you money. There's actually four different ways. So there's cash flow, there's appreciation, amortization, and tax benefits. And we're gonna break down each one of those in today's video. So all these figures were accurate at the time of this recording, but uh, the US residential real estate market was worth $43.5 trillion compared to the S&P 500, which was worth 35.7 trillion dollars and for all u.s public companies that number is 40 trillion dollars so you can see that uh, real estate is a bigger portion of money than the public markets combined more money, more money, more money. <laughs> so for gen x and millennials uh, real estate is actually the biggest portion of their uh, net worth so for Gen X, it's $13.6 trillion of the $46 trillion that Gen X has. And for millennials, it's $5 trillion of the $13.3 trillion that millennials have. <clears throat> and for baby boomers, it's the second biggest asset that they have right behind equities. And it's still $18.3 trillion of the $78 trillion that baby boomers possess. So a substantial portion of people's net worth is tied up in... Uh, real estate or their primary residence. So let's break it down. So let's talk about cash flow. So cash flow allows you to invest in other things besides uh, real estate. And it's also the thing that people want to try and add that security into their life. But a lot of people don't know how to evaluate cash flow on a residential property. So the 1% rule is a rule a lot of people use to look at the cash flow from a property. So assuming a property sold for $100,000, you would want the revenue to be $1,000 a month to hit that 1% rule. And this thumb rule really applies more to long-term rentals as opposed to short-term rentals, but it's a good rule of thumb if you're trying to do a quick evaluation of a property to see if the cash flow is going to work when you actually purchase the property. The other major metric people use to kind of evaluate cash flow for a property is cap rate. So cap rate represents the yield of a property over a one year time horizon, assuming the property is purchased in cash and there's no loan in place. So all that's to say is you take the net operating income of the property minus all the expenses and taxes and all that stuff, and then you divide it by the current market value of the property to get the cap rate. Obviously, the higher the cap rate, the more net operating income the property is making, but that higher cap rate comes with more risk. A lot of times, if you have a really high cap rate, it's because the property is older, so there's a higher likelihood of having deferred maintenance or issues that are, have been left unaddressed on the property, or it's in a less favorable area. So you're gonna have high risk uh, tenants, so people who are more likely uh, to stop paying or there's crime in the area or any number of issues that you can run into with having a property in like a C or D class area as opposed to an A or B class area. So when it comes to cap rate, you really want to get a cap rate that's in the middle for the market that you're looking at. Not too high, not too low. You really want that Goldilocks middle zone where you're getting a good return as far as income goes, but you're not assuming too much risk with those higher cap rate numbers that you can see. You don't really wanna use spreadsheet goggles when you're evaluating properties. There's a lot more factors to consider than just the income that it's producing. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is amortization. So amortization is really just a fancy way to say debt pay down. So amortization is the gradual repayment of a loan. That's it, that's all it really is. 
but it's not as intuitive as you would think. So as you pay down a loan, when you initially start paying, you're paying more towards interest than you're paying towards principal. And if you make additional principal payments early on in the repayment cycle for a loan, it drastically changes how much interest you pay across that loan. So when it comes to amortization, the relationship between the principal and interest and how your payments vary over time is not very intuitive. So the best way to actually kind of see this is by going into an amortization calculator. Uh, there's a ton on the internet. So if you just Google, you should be able to find one. And I'll leave a link to the one that I use in this example in the uh, description below. So for this example, we're gonna be looking at a loan of 200,000 uh, with a loan term of 30 years at an interest rate of 6%. So if you look at our example here, the total monthly payments that you're gonna make on this $200,000 loan is $431,676.38. So more than double the value of the home you're gonna be paying in interest. There's like $231,000 worth of interest that you're gonna be paying across this loan. And if you look at it, for the first several years, you're paying substantially more in interest than you are paying towards principal. And it doesn't change to where you're paying more principal than interest until year 19 of the loan. But if you make very small additional payments to principal across the loan, it makes a huge difference in the total interest that you pay on a property. So let's assume that you make an additional monthly payment of $100 doesn't sound like a lot, but if you paid an additional $100 every month on your loan, look at how much interest you save. So you're going to pay off this 30-year mortgage in 24 years and 7 months, and you're going to save almost $50,000 in interest by just making an additional $100 payment per month. You know, maybe you're like, I don't have an additional $100 in my budget. I can't swing that. But one thing a lot of people get is a tax return. So the average tax return in 2023 was $2,753. So assume every year you just took your tax return and you put it into the property. Look how much interest you save if you do that. So instead of taking 30 years to pay off your property, you pay it off in 20 years and you save almost $90,000 in interest. So making just a small tweak in your payments actually has a huge effect on how quickly you can pay off the loan. And one strategy that my wife and I like to use is called um, bi-weekly payments. So instead of paying once per month on our mortgage, we actually have it split out. So we pay bi-weekly. And if you do it this way, two times a year, you're going to make an additional payment into your loan. So it's like you've made one additional loan payment per year. So this is another website that allows you to see what these bi-weekly payments will do. So it's the same $200,000 loan at 6% for 30 years. And you can see that with the bi-weekly payments, our total interest has dropped substantially. So instead of this 231, we're at 180,000 for our total interest paid just by switching from the weekly payments to bi-weekly payments. And if you look at the amortization table, you can see that we pay off the property in 24 years just because uh, we switched to a bi-weekly payment plan instead of doing the monthly payment plan. So most people get paid every two weeks. So switching from a monthly lump sum to a bi-weekly 
payment plan is not a big stretch for them. And if you can pair this biweekly payment plan with a small additional contribution to principal, you're gonna get a huge difference in how quickly you can pay off this house and how quickly you can build equity into your property because your loan balance is lower. More money, more money, more money. Okay, so let's talk about appreciation. So there's two types of appreciation when you're uh, talking about real estate. There's natural appreciation. So this is when the property value increases over time just due to inflation and the economy and market forces. Imagine, you know, buying a house in San Francisco in the 70s and then looking at that same property value of that house now. That's that natural appreciation. And then there's forced appreciation. So forced appreciation happens when you actually renovate a property or you boost the revenue of a property so that forced appreciation can occur in the property. So uh, the biggest bang for your buck when you're uh, trying to force appreciation in a property is to add square footage. And, and if you can't add square footage in the form of an ADU or an additional bedroom, um, the next best thing is probably the kitchen. Uh, and updating um, that kitchen area is probably the next best thing, but you really wanna try and add square footage to force appreciation in a given property. You can also consider bringing the amenities up to the standards of that area to try and force appreciation in a property as well. A lot of house flippers and a lot of wholesalers, they will sell uh, to investors by just taking a property that's out of date and then updating the amenities and appliances to the current standards for the market and selling at that premium by forcing appreciation in the property. All right, so let's talk about the final way real estate makes you money, taxes. So there are a ton of tax benefits associated with real estate. So the first way is if you have a residential property, your primary residence, up to $250,000 of capital gains in your primary residence is completely tax-free. So the one caveat, there's a five-year period and you had to live in the property for two years out of that five-year period for it to be considered your primary residence. And then you can sell the property and up to $250,000 of the capital gains from that property are completely tax-free. More money, more money, more money. So that's a huge benefit. The other thing is a 1031 exchange. So what a 1031 exchange is, is it allows you to defer the taxes on an investment property as long as you are reinvesting that money from the investment property into another investment property. So the, the way you go about doing this is you need to find a qualified intermediary. So you cannot actually take the funds from the sell of the property. The funds from the sell of the property have to go to a qualified intermediary and uh, you have to identify what property you're going to be investing in within 45 days of the sell of the initial investment property. And you can identify up to three properties and if you meet special requirements, you can identify more than three properties, but you have to specify in writing to this qualified intermediary what the three properties you're considering purchasing are. And then within 180 days of you selling the original investment property, you have to close on the new investment property. And as long as you meet all the requirements, uh, you can actually defer the taxes that you would have to pay on any capital gains from a property forever. You can just continue investing your, your capital from one property to the next property to the next property to the next property and organically growing uh, your real estate portfolio with, without paying any taxes. Okay, let's talk depreciation. So depreciation allows you to capture your costs in a property across the expected life of the property. So for commercial real estate, that's 39 years, and for residential real estate, that's 27 and a half years. So you can use this depreciation to offset your income from the property for a given year. And thanks to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, you can actually take 100% of the depreciation that you are going to take across the whole lifespan of investment property in the first year of 
uh, owning the investment property. And that's called bonus depreciation. That could go away in 2025, so we'll see if they renew it, but it is a major benefit for uh, depreciation. And then the other thing is cost segregation studies. So some of these large commercial properties, they'll actually hire engineering firms to go in and analyze which portions of their property will actually depreciate faster than the normal expected life of the property and then they'll provide them this study so they can actually take depreciation on a more accelerated basis than you would normally take for the property. So all these things combined together add up to very, very large tax benefits, especially for commercial properties, but the cost segregation studies you can actually do on short-term rentals as well. So let's get into the secret sauce of all of this. So commercial real estate actually works different than residential real estate. So we were talking about cap rate earlier, how it's the net operating income over the value of the property. You can actually rearrange this equation to actually have the value of the property dictated by net operating income and the cap rate. And that is how people actually evaluate the value of commercial properties. So if you are able to boost the income from a commercial property in a given year by doing renovations, bringing in new tenants, lowering vacancy, whatever, you actually boost the value of the property. So not only are you getting more cash flow, but you also are forcing appreciation in the property. And then if you do a cost segregation study, you're getting a ton of tax benefits as well. So Commercial real estate is kind of the trifecta. It is, it is the way that the wealthy are able to continue building their wealth while offsetting their tax bills to almost zero dollars. They invest in commercial real estate and they're boosting their net worth by forcing appreciation, getting additional cash flow, and offsetting their taxes. It's cheat code status. More money, more money, more money. So that's the video for today. Uh, thanks for tuning in. If there's something you want me to expand upon in a future video, please leave a comment down below, like, and subscribe, and I'll catch you guys next time.